Weather prediction is one of the hardest physics and mathematical problems to solve. For over a century, people have been trying to figure out how to predict the weather and by extension, how to predict the future. And recently companies like Google, Nvidia have published papers that they may have cracked the code. AI weather models that perform with 99% accuracy for a 10 day model produced in one minute. But to understand why AI forecasting might be such a game changer, we need to understand where our present day weather models came from. So let's time travel to the beautiful city of Oslo, Norway in the early 1900s. The father of modern day weather forecasting is Wilhelm Björknes. In the early 1900s, Björknes was fascinated by the weather and the atmosphere and he wanted to figure out if humans could predict the weather. During his physics and mathematical career, he defined what is known today as the primitive equations of weather modeling. These key equations he derived govern our weather models to this day. Björknes had one big problem in the early 1900s. He didn't really know how to solve these primitive equations. Why? Before we go any further, I gotta dust off my old math degree and put it to work. Because we need to understand these primitive equations and why they're so hard to solve. Weather models today are governed by these equations, the primitive equations. These three complicated equations tell us two key things. One, temperature, and two, type of wind. And we wanna solve these equations to inform wind movement and temperature in order to inform our weather patterns. But if you look closely at these equations, you might notice this very swirly delta. This delta indicates that these equations should be solved as partial differential equations, or PDEs. Not only do we need to solve for wind and temperature, but we need to understand how wind and temperature change over time. So when solved correctly, these equations don't just tell us wind and temperature on an X, Y, Z plane, but over time. And time is a key factor here. And that's the basis of modern day weather prediction. Equations that give us an approximation of our atmosphere over time. Our friend Birkness knew these equations were super important to weather prediction. I mean, he even published a paper in 1904 outlining conceptually how to solve these equations. But the techniques to solve these types of partial differential equations simply hadn't been derived yet. Fortunately, about two decades later and across the North Sea was Lewis Fry Richardson, an English mathematician and physicist who set off to solve the primitive equations as his life's work. Richardson learned about Björknes's work and spent a good portion of his career trying to solve these primitive equations. Fortunately for weather enthusiasts like us, in 1922, Richardson published Weather Prediction by Numerical Process, a 300-page textbook on how to solve Björknes' primitive equations. Using what he outlined in his book, Richardson took six weeks to create a six-hour forecast for two points in Central Europe, hardly fast enough to be useful and far off from being able to predict future weather. But Richardson dreamed of a more computable future. And when I say dreamed, I mean literally. There's this really amazing passage in this textbook where Richardson describes a human computer in a theater, each person working on an equation or part of an equation and communicating instantaneously their answers to ultimately create a global weather forecast. He's basically describing the human computer scene in three body problem, another notably chaotic and unstable system. Richardson's book was a breakthrough, but still his fantasy of a theater filled with mathematicians was a pipe dream. But if we fast forward to the 1940s and the 1950s, World War II brought through a huge wave of technological advances. Most importantly, a revolution to computing and huge investments from the US government into weather prediction programs. It wasn't until the invention of computing and computer simulations that the computation time was reduced to less than the forecast time. Remember, physicists and mathematicians were limited by the time it took them to manually compute the solutions to these equations. So in the mid-1940s, the electronic numerator, integrator, and computer, 
or ENIAC, was built and given to the University of Pennsylvania. ENIAC was initially used to calculate thermonuclear reactions to support building the hydrogen bomb by John von Neumann. After World War II, von Neumann and one of his physics friends, Jules Charney, took ENIAC and applied it to weather forecasting. And something remarkable happened. It took 24 hours of processing time to create a 24-hour weather forecast. For the first time ever, the ability to predict the future was on the horizon. Since the 50s, investments in supercomputers and advances in technology have propelled numerical weather prediction to be useful for the average person, like you or me. Making the primitive equations into a supercomputer is very complicated. We need to initialize our models, parameterize our models, and error correct. To initialize these equations, that's where we're bringing in our observable data, like surface observations from the local weather service, weather balloon observations, aircraft reports, buoy reports, and so many other things. But there lies a major problem. We'll never know the state of all points in the atmosphere at a specific moment in time. Our data will always be delayed. Even at the fastest speeds of transmission, our data is already outdated from the current state of the atmosphere. And we don't have infinite data points to set up our models. Our data is massively incomplete and our computers only run to a certain amount of accuracy. Therefore, our models already starting potentially inaccurately. So even the tiniest error in the data that we have or the calculations that we apply or the model we use can lead to a prediction far removed from what is actually going to happen. See, partial differential equations don't have a perfect analytical solution. Partial differential equations are complex and we have to rely on numerical methods and approximations to get close to an answer. But if the starting point or initialization is incomplete, there's room for error and incorrect predictions. If that's not enough, there's a new problem. There are things in the atmosphere that are smaller than the resolution of a weather model, namely clouds and geography. So we have to bring in the concept of parameterization, representing clouds, geography, by relating them to variables on a scale that the model will resolve. One of those big problems being cumulus clouds, that can cause severe weather and tornadoes. So we need to build in parameters that allow the models to create and recognize clouds. Finally, we need to correct our errors or implement the concept of model output statistics. After a model is run, it accounts for local effects that cannot be resolved by the model due to grid resolution. Model output statistics give us information like min-max temperatures or percent precipitation creating the more detailed forecasts that you and I might be using on a day-to-day. -day. And with each decade, investments in supercomputers, refinement of our numerical models, we keep getting closer to predicting the uncertain, chaotic nature of our atmosphere. But here's the thing, models like the Euro model take a really long time to run. If you're anything like me, you've probably sat on tropical tidbits, aggressively refreshing the page, waiting for the euro to populate to see if a hurricane is going to be riding up the east coast and slamming into lovely little new england honestly if you're watching at this point you probably have for the euro model it takes a couple hours to run and then over an hour to release the 10-day forecast that's pretty dang slow so this begs the question is there a faster way to predict the weather well this is where ai might be able to help just last year, Google announced GraphCast, their AI weather model. Google was able to produce a 10-day weather forecast in just about a minute. Remember, the Euro and other common models we use today take hours to run and about an hour to release to the public. Meanwhile, GraphCast outperformed the high-resolution forecast on 90% of future variables. And other large tech companies like Huawei and NVIDIA have published similar results. So I guess the video's over? AI weather models win? I really hope you didn't leave because I was trying to do a bit. With any published science, we need to talk about the caveats. So how do you actually build an AI weather model? To build any useful AI or machine learning model, you need data and lots of it. Fortunately, the National Oceanic 
Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, has a program called NOAA Open Data Dissemination, or NOD. NOAA generates tens of terabytes a day of observational weather data. Fortunately, NOAA has partnered with some of the largest tech companies to host open data on commercial cloud platforms. This is just one example of the data that's available. Okay, so we got the data. How do we build an AI model? To train an AI model, you need to take your vast set of data and split it into two separate sections, what's called trained data and untrained data. You're gonna first build up a model that's gonna take in a little bit of the training data and hopefully output what you want. And as you're putting in more data, adjusting your parameters to get the outputs you're looking for. Once you feel like your model's doing a very good job with the trained data, you're gonna give it a little bit of the untrained data. The untrained data is what you're gonna give your model to see if it actually works. And with this concept of AI pulled in, it feels like this video and weather forecasting has taken a complete 180. Today in the world of numerical weather prediction, we take a bunch of measurements, populate them into some equations, and allow the equations to run and generate scenarios in the future. There's a risk that if we get the input wrong, we might get some crazy weather predictions. But because we're using equations rooted in linear algebra, aka partial differential equations, we have a sense of what should happen and should be able to understand the extremes of the results. AI, on the other hand, honestly, we don't know what's going on inside the model. Sure, the people who created it might, but you, me, we don't know. What we do know is these AI models from Google, Huawei, NVIDIA take the present information, predict the next step of the weather forecast, and use that prediction as the iterative next step in their forecasting, all based and trained on observational data. And here lies the biggest concern I have with these AI forecasting models. To you, me, anyone who is not working on these models, we don't know how the AI has decided what's supposed to happen next. These models could have created their own versions of the primitive equations we use today, or they're just looking for patterns from historical data. Even with Google's strong results from GraphCast, weather forecasting is far from solved. Notably, GraphCast doesn't provide probabilistic forecasts that we would get from the model output statistics from an actual meteorologist. GraphCast also tends to underestimate severe weather events like hurricanes and flooding, potentially putting lives at risk. Okay, so we've learned that these weather models are fast, kind of accurate. So should we get rid of Bjorknes's and Richardson's work and make AI the future? Honestly, probably not. These AI models don't automatically solve the problem of predicting the weather. However, they should be used as an additional tool for meteorologists to use. Weather prediction has come a very long day since the days of Bjorknes and Richardson. From manual calculations to supercomputers and now AI, predicting the chaotic nature of our atmosphere is a daunting challenge. As we continue to develop and refine these technologies, combining traditional numerical weather forecasting with cutting-edge AI, we move closer to having more reliable forecasts. This will not only help us better prepare for everyday weather, but mitigate the risks of more extreme events. The future of weather forecasting is incredibly bright, and with continued investment in research and technology, we can look forward to a world where weather models and weather prediction are faster, more accurate, and more dependable. If you've made it to this point of the video, thank you so much for watching. This video was truly a labor of love and I enjoyed doing all of the research behind it. If you have any thoughts about this video or suggestions for a future video, leave them in the comments down below. Bye.